Hello, I'm Dr. Howard L. Smith, Associate Professor at the University of Texas in San Antonio. I'd like to share with you today some thoughts and some research on education and instruction for African American children. Whose knowledge? Whose culture? The socio-cultural context of education will be the primary focus. I'll answer such questions as, what is the purpose of public education? Who owns it? What is the role of the teacher? What is the role of schools? How is learning approached? How does education relate to equity, diversity, access, and social justice? James Baldwin, back in the 1960s, proposed the following. I began by saying that one of the paradoxes of education was that precisely at the point when you begin to develop a conscience, you must find yourself at war with your society. It is your responsibility to change society if you think of yourself as an educated person. And James Baldwin said that back in the late 60s. The presentation will have three primary foci. It will be a review of some of the realities of education in African American communities. I will trace the educational directory for African Americans from the 1600s to the present day, and I will use a historical perspective of the social, economic, and cultural constraints experienced by African Americans to explain behaviors and beliefs that persist within and about the African American community. One of the first realities is that in the 17th century, slaves came to America. Now the term slavery conjures up a series of images and feelings. In the United States, every horrific thing you could imagine was perpetrated against people of African descent because this practice was legal. It was practiced on this land before we became a separate country and did not become illegal until the 19th century. Two things you should note. Even while people in America were fighting for and won their independence from England, they still wanted people, black people, to be slaves. The other thing is that while the laws expressly forbidding slavery were passed, Many of the conditions continued even after those laws were in place. In the case of African Americans in the United States, until the close of the 19th century, over 90% of them were unable to read or write. Now, from an historical perspective, I offer this quote. Now, this is from Henry Berry of Jefferson. He said this in the House of Delegates of Virginia in 1832, and I quote, We have, as far as possible, closed every avenue by which light may enter their minds. If we could extinguish their capacity to see the light, our work would be completed. They would then be on a level with the beasts of the field, and we should be safe. I am not certain that we would not do it if we could find out the process and that on the plea of necessity. Now, this also connects with another reality, and that is every southern state except Tennessee had laws expressly forbidding instruction for African Americans until the Reconstruction period. Uh, an interesting example is Reverend Richard Fuller, a slaveholder and plantation owner. Now, he taught his slaves to read even after the South Carolina legislature of 1850 refused his petition to that effect. Those who could read and write, those African Americans, were part of a slave aristocracy. They engaged in record keeping, skilled labor, artisanship, household management, the purchase of insurance and other commercial activities and Reverend Fuller wanted his slaves to be able to engage in some of those activities. So it wasn't benevolence, but rather an economic reason that he wanted his slaves to be able to read and write. 
Now, Harriet Jacobs, best known as the fugitive slave author of the landmark American slave narrative, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, written by herself, is an example of a woman that could read and write. So let me ask this question, get a partner and answer. Why do you think slave owners and supporters of slavery prohibited Africans from education during this time? I say again, why do you think slave owners and supporters of slavery prohibited Africans from education during this time? Take a few minutes. Not everyone was in favor of slavery. Here's a quote from a Reverend McManus. Although the darker pigmentation of their skin excluded Negroes from the mainstream of colonial life, it raised no barriers to them in the hereafter. The religious leaders of every colony saw no reason why slaves could not be converted into conventional Christians. So let me ask you this question. What was the motivation of local religions for educating African Americans? One group that was instrumental in educating African Americans, one religious group, was the Quakers. Members of this religious order are often indexed as early abolitionists and unanimous supporters of emancipation. They were sometimes called Friends, the Quakers were. The Friends did play key, a key role in abolition and, emas and the emancipation movement on both sides of the Atlantic and beyond. However, they were divided on the issue. In fact, this argument about slavery or its abolition initiated three centuries of Quaker debate and activism over the problem of slavery. In the 17th century and most of the 18th century, Quakers were divided on the issue, particularly in the British American colonies, with some denouncing slavery and others owning slaves. In the following century, Quakers were more unified in their opposition to slavery, but encountered a range of spiritual, political, and personal challenges while taking over their anti-slavery message to a wider audience. Now, one of the things behind religion and learning to read is the following. Just because they espoused having slaves learn to read, this was not an admission of racial equality, necessarily. Members of the clergy and laity commonly professed a belief in the inherent inferiority of African Americans. They also professed a belief that they were human and had souls to be saved from fire and brimstone. Members of the Quaker religion are often indexed as early abolitionists, both the men and the women. They supported emancipation of the slave. One interesting example is a woman named Prudence Crandall. In 1833, Crandall opened a school for colored young ladies in Connecticut that attracted African-American women from Providence, Boston, and New York. In fact, the building in which she had her school still stands. Today, it's now a museum. What is interesting and sad about the Crandall's school experience is that her school was not accepted by the general population of the town. Townspeople objected to the very existence of Crandall's school. Her neighbors smeared her home with feces and set it on fire while storekeepers refused to sell her provisions. She was arrested, tried in court, and convicted twice, but kept her school running for as long as possible. Now, 
Here's a question for you. Why were the townspeople so opposed to Prudence Crandall's school? So let's talk about education and liberation, because the African Americans weren't slaves forever. By the mid-1800s, education was no longer uniquely connected to the church, and African Americans understood education to be the key to participation in the democratic process. One person said, when African Americans fought to gain literacy, they expressed a desire for freedom and self-determination, which had deep roots in modern culture. Stories of literate slaves traveled quickly from plantation to plantation and were a great source of satisfaction within the slave quarters. Those so schooled became cultural mediators and translators of the written word for those who could not read. They facilitated group expression and interaction around texts. Now, the idea of being literate and sharing information for African Americans could be traced directly back to West Africa. The origin of that role can be traced to the Griots, G-R-I-O-T-S, of West Africa. These were skilled orators who helped to sustain the knowledge of the culture through songs, stories, and other oral events. In so doing, they demonstrated how knowledge and spoken text were socially constructed. One of the first colleges for African American women was Spelman College, which graduated its first group of young women in 1892. The school was started by two white women who were opposed to slavery. Now, soon after the Emancipation Proclamation, which made slavery illegal in the United States, right after that Civil War, education became the rallying cry of those seeking to improve their lot of former slaves whose prospects were limited usually to hard labor in the fields or to domestic work, work in white people's home. According to two women who were over 100 years old when they died, black people during the period immediately following emancipation would be lucky to have had the chance to learn to read and write well enough to sign their own names. Perhaps the most striking illustration of the Freedmen's quest for self-improvement was their seemingly unquenchable thirst for education. Now, this was written by a gentleman named Fawner back in 1988. He went on to say that access to education for themselves and their children was, for blacks, central to the meaning of freedom, and white contemporaries were astonished by their avidity for learning. In 1865, the United States Congress instituted something called the Freedmen's Bureau, which was there to assist the newly freed African Americans. The primary function was to supervise and coordinate a vast educational enterprise located in Texas and other southern states. All levels of education from primary through and including tertiary were offered. Such states as Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Delaware, and the District of Columbia all had offices of the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, one thing you should know about the teachers and, and the Freedmen's Bureau was that most educators, most teachers that were supplied came from the American Missionary Association with the majority initially coming from the northern states. 
educated African Americans were recruited to the Southern schools. Schools off up into the 1950s commonly I'm sorry, schools in the 1950s commonly utilized a curriculum that emphasized vocational training, physical and manual labor, labor and the acceptance of racial subservience for Negroes. What that means is that even after slavery was illegal and it was okay for African Americans to, to have education, the kinds of education they could normally obtain were, were not the kinds that would make you nurses or doctors or lawyers, but rather they made you domestics, good with a vacuum cleaner, good with some flour, some eggs, and some milk, or good with a sewing machine. These are not schools to train you to be a professional. Now, this system, this model of education was known as the Hampton-Tuskegee model of education. Children educated under this model read from the Bible, memorized rules of civic responsibility, and developed circumscribed literacy skills needed for manual or industrial labor. So again, they weren't trained to be doctors or lawyers. They were trained to work a sewing machine or to work a metal grinder. An elementary school principal who used this Tuskegee Hampton model explained the goals. Every boy will eventually become a first class cook with the ability to make his own shirt. Now, even though it was many years ago that it finally stopped, you can actually find pamphlets and reading materials that were used at these schools. The main subjects that were taught under this Tuskegee Hampton model uh, were arithmetic, reading, writing, history, civics, political science, home economics for women, and vocational training for men. Which brings us to an interesting question. The schools were separate, but were they equal? I can ask that question because one of the laws at the time was that schools were supposed to be separate and public conveyances were supposed to be separate. And it was just assumed that people in either setting, in the white setting or the black setting, were receiving the same services. But upon inspection, one could see that the colored schools, the schools for African Americans, were far inferior to the white schools. Oftentimes, school was held at a church, and the children would kneel on the floor and use the pews of the church as their desks. Teachers and school directors had to make petitions to parents and community members in order to obtain the needed supplies. Writing materials were scarce and books were usually outdated. African American schools into the 1960s received yellow grammar books, coverless dictionaries, outdated history texts, tattered spellers, and incomplete sets of encyclopedias from the white schools. These were called the cast-offs the materials that the white schools didn't want. In some cases, it was found that no supplies except a broom were furnished to the school by the school district during the entire year. School terms for African Americans were shortened. In Arkansas, for instance, several hundred schools used an academic calendar of less than 60 days. Towns and cities that had available monies for education channeled them toward their white schools. Districts would not repair Negro schools, let alone build new ones. Scores of children spanning seven grade levels were regularly assigned to one classroom. This was especially true during the Depression of the 1930s. Now, as I pointed out, many of these activities for education came under the guise or under the control of the Freedmen's Bureau, which was established in Washington, D.C. 
but some white racists were vehemently opposed to the Freedmen's Bureau and all of their activities. Sometimes the schools for Negroes were burned down. Many times the teachers, the missionary teachers, were intimidated. Now there were some positive things. The Texas Teachers Convention of 1866 passed a resolution urging training for the newly freed African Americans of Texas. The Texas government and schooling for African Americans is a very interesting example. And I'll talk about the events between 1866 and 1876. Now, there are differing opinions for that 10-year period. The Constitution of 1866 said that income derived from the public school fund be employed exclusively for the education of white scholastic inhabitants. African Americans taxed for the maintenance of public schools for Africans and their children, which meant that there was an additional tax placed upon African Americans, even though there was a general tax for the entire population. I guess I should explain the Texas situation a bit more. There was Reconstruction legis legislation in the 1870s, which eliminated segregation and gave Texas a single educational system in which all children were supposed to share. But in 1873 and again in 1875, the state legislature repealed most of the laws of the Reconstruction period. When you look at the United States in the time period between the 1920s and the 1930s, there were obvious disparities between the white schools and the African American schools. The average length of the school term for black children was shorter than that for whites, and Texas spent an average of $3.39, or about a third less for the education of African American students than for their white students. African American teachers were paid significantly less than white teachers. That would be $91.60 a month compared with $120.03 a month. In 1940, there were 222,715 black pupils in 116 accredited Texas high schools, 12 of which were rated by the Southern Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools. Approximately half of the 6,439 teachers had degrees. But as I mentioned before, the Great Depression of the 1930s exacerbated educational inequities. So during the Great Depression years, in hundreds of rural schools, uh, there were just four blank unpainted walls, a few rickety benches, an old stove propped up on brick racks, and two or three boards nailed together and painted black for a blackboard. In many cases, this constituted the sum total of the furniture and teaching equipment. Now that was found by President Hoover's 1931 National Advisory Committee on Education. During the Great Depression years, some states instituted a 10-year adoption of textbooks. Other districts did not purchase materials at all. There were terrible books published expressly for African Americans, including a coon alphabet or comical coons. Again, the word coon is a word or a term that's been used to disparage African Americans. The early 1950s marked several changes, improvements in school buildings and facilities, equalization of teacher salaries, 
increase in funds for classroom instruction and libraries all occurred during this time period. We began to see a few more children's books with brown faces in them. Not that the content necessarily changed to reflect the African American culture, but at least the pictures have been painted brown to acknowledge the existence of African Americans in American society. Some of the important changes that took place I have on a timeline. There was a court case called Plessy versus Ferguson, and that was in 1896. That's where the U.S. Supreme Court decided that a Louisiana law mandating separate but equal accommodations for blacks and whites on interstate railroads was constitutional. Then you have the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955, and what happened there was a woman named Rosa Parks uh, refusing to sit in the back of the bus caused quite an uproar. The boycott's goal was to protest segregation in public buses. It lasted more than a year. What you should know is that because of Rosa Parks the Catalyst, African Americans chose not to use the public bus service because they did not want to ride in the back of the bus. And so for over an entire year, African Americans either walked to work or they got a ride with friends who had a motor car. We have Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Now this was a landmark court case that allowed for the desegregation of schools. Then we have in 1957, the National Guard was called in to force desegregation in the schools of Little Rock, Arkansas. The Arkansas governor, who's named Orval Faubus, called out the Arkansas National Guard to stop African Americans from attending all-white schools. President Dwight Eisenhower, at the time, took control of the National Guard and forced the admission of those colored students. Then another important court case is Plyer versus Doe, which happened in 1982 not that long ago, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a state statute denying funding for education to children who were illegal immigrants and simultaneously struck down a municipal school district's attempt to charge illegal immigrants an annual of $1,000 tuition for each undocumented student to compensate for the lost state funding. In the last 18 months, several things have happened to schools, including the textbooks that they're finding are racist. I don't have a recording to offer you, but maybe in a few minutes I will. What can I say to sum this up? Education for African Americans can be characterized as a struggle for access, a struggle for full participation, a struggle for meaningful, authentic experiences. When laws against their education were repealed, African Americans, children and adults alike, invested their time, money, and labor into education. However, in spite of such efforts, Research finds strong evidence that the restrictions placed on earlier generations of African Americans decreases the likelihood of success of the generations that followed. So, why don't you talk with a classmate or two? What exactly did you find out about African Americans in the United States and their educational experience? Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Have a good day.